We have some announcements here. There are a boatload of announcements because there are so many things happening. Today we're going to recognize the deacons in just a little bit, so if the deacons could make their way up over to the back here, that would be wonderful. Breakfast potluck. How are you all doing with the fast? Okay, I knew it. Four of you are skinny as rails and just can't. You're gaunt. You're kind of beat up. It's kicked you in the teeth a little bit. Praise the Lord. I know that people have been doing the fast, and it's been good. I just want to encourage you, even in this last week, if you haven't started yet, start this week. Start fasting this week and be a part of what God is doing. Hear what he's saying. The biggest thing is you're going to be more intimate with God, and that's the end, that's the end of everything for us, is to be more intimate with God, because his desire is to be intimate with us. So you can still join the fast. Oh, you know what we're going to do, though? Next week, we're going to break the fast. Yeah. And we break the fast with a break fast or a breakfast in the back, you can bring a dish to pass. If you have any questions about it, Jane, are you still here? You di Stand up, Jane. Nobody knows you. <laughs> Stand up, Jane. See Jane and tell her what hot dish you're going to bring. And if you're going to help me out, if I'm breaking a fast, I want to break it right. So bring, tell her what desserts you're going to bring. All right, so we'll take care of that next week after the service. So don't come in filled with food. We'll know you cheated if you're not eating. Water, and bapti water baptism, January 21st. If you want to be water baptized, just call the office and they'll get it all set up. All right? Baby dedication. If you have a baby that you have not dedicated to the Lord and you want to dedicate your baby next week, you can do that as well. Call the office and they'll tell you when and how and where it works. Men's No Regret Conference. This is a big deal. It's been a big deal for the last several years. It's just a growing thing. February 3rd. Get signed up. Pay your money for that. Woman's White Horse. Boy, there's just a lot of stuff going on. Women's White Horse Conference. It's in your bulletin, the 7th through the 9th of February. It's in West Lafayette, Indiana. Every time the women come back after that conference, they're pretty tough to deal with. They want to do stuff. I can't run that fast. I can't do what they're asking. But go. You will be moved if you go. Man, that's exhausting. All right. We got another event. And I can't find it in my notes, but I know it's lurking in here somewhere. Paper, airplanes, dad's son, granddad's grandsons. You are to come with your grandpas. Ooh. You are to come with your grandpas. That is a flyer, man. You are to come with your dad's. So we can come home, right? No, I'm sitting. <laughs> this is just a fun opportunity for dads to connect with sons and grandsons. Be a part of it. It's going to take two hours to have a blast with your dad, and you will learn the skills that I just demonstrated right here. I did not make any of those. I didn't want to scare anybody who sent people away on a mission trip, Shelly. I didn't want to frighten you to see crashes all over the place with my paper airplane, so that's... They arrived. Lumiai, Ray, Mike Waldrop, they all arrived at their destination. What that means is continue to be praying for them. Continue to be praying for them. And they will feel those prayers, I believe, in Jesus' name. All right. Our work done. Pastor Donnie, if you come to the forefront. Is oh, it, man. Is it, is it You're like a now? ninja. <laughs> now is it on? Oh, it is on. on. It is on. All right, good morning, everyone, and you cold people out there. I'll tell you, it was cold for me this morning, I know. But I'm Don Olson, an associate pastor here at Living Hope Church. And this morning, I have the privilege to introduce to you nine men from our congregation who answered the call, took the training necessary to become deacons here at Living Hope Church. And in the Bible and the book of Acts, go ahead, we can give them a hand. All right, in the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, and verses 2 to 4, it says, So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, We apostles should not spend our time teaching, or we should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. 
And so, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and we'll give them this responsibility. And so they had the choosing of the first deacons. And then in the first chapter of Timothy, uh, no, I should say the third chapter of 1 Timothy, verse 8, it says, In the same way, deacons must be well-respected and have integrity. And with this information, the pastors and elders here of Living Hope Church agreed that these men fit this description. And therefore, let me introduce at this time the nine new deacons. And if you'll come forward, first will be Jeff Howard. Jeff Hubbard. And next, and next will be Jacob Castor. And then I'm going to introduce Ray Kizzy. Of course, Ray is off somewhere around Singapore by this time, I believe. So, uh, yay for Ray. And next we'll have Nick Scheffelbein. And next will be Mark Schuyler. And then will be John Smiths. And then we'll have Matt Sirwhitey. And then we'll have Todd Vandehei. And lastly, it'll be Dennis Young. And as you know, that Dennis goes out in style, doesn't he? Well, I, I'm going to just say it was a pleasure meeting with these guys, training with these guys, and welcome them to... Uh, Deacons of Living Hope Church to serve you all. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Today, uh, we're reading out of uh, Job, Job 1. Uh, there was a man in the land of Uz where, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and, when, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus 
Job did regularly. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, for, for, From going to and fro to the earth, on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of, ha of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now... Stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will surely curse your, you to your face. Good morning. I'm Steve Vanderboom. Um, I've been a deacon here for a whole bunch of years, and everybody knows me, so. Job 1.12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the deer, uh, deer donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided them and took them away, Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's room, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. So, Lord, we just come before you this morning. We thank you for all your many blessings, Lord. We uh, thank you for the new deacons that we have. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, you would give us your message through Pastor Mike this morning and just open everyone's heart to be able to understand your word, Lord. And we ask these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, brother. You may have a seat. Good morning. My name is Mike LeClaire. I'm the pastor of Living Hope Church. And if you're a visitor here, I'd like to just say welcome to you. It's hard to get to connect with people the first time they come. So the onus is now on you to come up and say hello. Tell me who you are. Tell me what you do. And tell me what you thought about the first service. You can do that after today. Then tell me the next week you come back who you're bringing with you and what's their name. For you who are here all the time, it's your turn to tell me who you brought here and what's their name. Just a little charge for everybody here. Do you guys like the worship today? Yeah. Oh, my. Worship's beautiful. The hearts of the people that step on, on this altar are pure, I believe, and they care about what they do. They care about serving Christ. You got a picture of a bunch of men who care about serving Christ. We have a staff 
uh, secretarial staff, maintenance staff, who care and love Jesus Christ, and that's their way of serving. We have women in this church who love and serve God, and nobody's watching. You may be watching, but nobody knows what they do. They're incredible. And this church moves because of the heart and the spirit of the people um, in this church. And the uh, last thing is we have a congregation who loves and serves God because I know, I know it because you gave an incredible amount of money to send some people to a faraway land to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's not the first time you've done it. You've done it with the Kelly family where you send them to Kenya, Africa. And he still, they still work all over the world setting up Christian materials to get to the peoples who need materials so that they can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have another one in northern Kenya that we support with your money, which becomes the church's money, which we send, and uh, which we help support. It's because you love God, and you love those who serve him, and you want to be a part of what they're doing. That's not going to stop. It's only going to increase. There's going to be more people called to go. And we'll serve them. Do you know we have people here in this church who love and serve God on Thursday nights, helping people with whatever comes across them in their path that's so difficult to deal with. They're there to meet them every Thursday. Meet them and then feed them. Love them and then care about them. Running groups and helping people work through issues. I sit in one of those groups. I know. I wear them out. I got issues all over the place. But I'm working on them. Why can I work on them? Because they're safe. And they let me work on them. Freely. We have people on Friday nights who love and serve Christ. On, on serving at Able Church. Loving faithfully. Preaching the word of God. And Pastor Tim, I'm telling you right now, I know you preach the doctoral thesis on Friday nights. And Janice, you're preaching a doctoral thesis every Friday night. Material that just makes us go, whoa, faithfully. Why? Because they believe God and what he's doing in that world, which is our world. So God is working in this church, and I don't know why I'm saying it, other than I believe the Spirit is leading me to share it. We're going to talk about the book of Job today. Maybe that's why I'm saying all these nice things. This poor guy, this miserable man has been through it and back. He has been through it and back. And if you caught the first chapter, there are a whole bunch more than the first chapter that we read today. There's 40 chapters. 40, 42. That talk about the beating that this guy took in life. That talk about his ups and downs and his struggles that you and I have too. That talk about the attack of the enemy of his soul, which we feel, but we don't know where it comes from because we don't discern spiritual things maybe. Or maybe we do, and we know where the root of those things are. Or he had to do it when the one he loved, the one he believed in, the one he worshipped, allowed things to happen. And that same one allows things to happen today because he is at work doing something. What's he doing? I don't know. He's doing something. What's it about? It's about me, and it's about you. Because he so desperately loves you that he wants you to be right by him at a deeper level than where you currently are and than where I currently am. That's what the story of Job is about. But we're not going to go home just yet. Ooh, did you hear that? He's still, he's talking. <laughs> Job is a real person. However, he's not an Israelite. He believes in the God of Israel. Job uses the covenant name for God. Yahweh, the one who goes on existing. But he also uses the name of God associated with the patriarchs, the Almighty. So Job is a Gentile, I believe. But he loves the God of Israel. And God is going to take him to task because he's going to do a work in him. And you'll see where that goes. I got a little humming up here. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. God is saying this about Job. God said he loved me and he served me when others didn't at the same level. 
God is speaking about him and he is, for the lack of a better term, because this isn't the best term, but he is proud of him, like a father would be proud of his son. It's not the same kind of pride that, that God has for the son who says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It's another level of intimacy. But that's his heart for Job. And so there's a lifestyle that they had. And he was blessed beyond measure. He was the wealthiest guy in the land. He had seven sons and three daughters that were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all people of the East. The guy was loaded. He just had it all in that day. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on the appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. Okay, so now he has a family. The family gets together and they celebrate. All right? Job, who is a man of God, does not want his children to flail away in the world of sin. So he, he does something that I think a lot of us do in another kind of way. And in verse 5 it says, So it was when the days of fasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them, his children, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. So he's giving offerings, much like the Israelites would do back in the day, for... God to cover the sin of his children. He didn't know what those sins were, but he assumed that they probably had them. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did this regularly. That's the kind of man that Job was. And I believe that we have parents sitting in this congregation right now. You act the same way with your own children, and you're saying, I am praying for my kids. I am praying because they don't get it yet. Or they don't get it at the level that you get it. And if they get it at the level that you get it or beyond, then pray for yourself. But keep praying for your kids. But we do that because we can't control, but we can give it to God and let him take care of them. You ever do that? You ever pray for your own family, your own children? Do you ever pray for children? Maybe you don't have any, but do you ever pray for children that aren't yours, that you just see these little adorable kids running around this church? Do you ever pray for them? That's what we're called to do. But he would give up a sacrifice and an offering on their behalf. I'm going to tell you this right now. That does not save you. That helps you to hear from God. or That prompts God to move in a different kind of way, I believe. To prepare hearts to receive them when they do see them. God's always at work. We're going to see that in this portion of Scripture. So, God... Blessing upon Job is because of Job's righteousness. That doesn't happen with us. God blesses who he will bless. He blesses sometimes everybody. He blesses everybody with rain. When rain comes down, he doesn't just bless the farmer. He blesses the person in the city. He blesses the person that's sweating from the heat. He blesses, he blesses all. It doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. He blesses all people. But there was something special about the relationship with him and Job, and he blessed him abundantly. And it has something to do with his spiritual righteousness in this case. So know that Job was blessed by God. Second thing is, Satan is alive and well at this point. He's alive, not well. He's not a good person, not a good being. He's evil. And it says in verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God, those are the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan. The word Satan is adversary. And if you've ever come across difficult things in your lives that are just overwhelming and have evil attached to it, that's what the adversary does. He comes against God's children. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered and, and said to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth on it. How could he do that? Well, the Bible tells us that Satan is the prince of the air. He has authority. And if you go back to Ephesians, we know that authority is a real thing. For we wrestle not against our flesh and blood or against other people, but we wrestle against powers, spiritual forces of wickedness. In heavenly places. That's what we wrestle about. And I'm kind of butchering that scripture a little bit, but I think you get the gist of what I'm saying. Not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers. Principalities are the leadership of the demonic realm. And they have power more than human beings do. They're spiritual beings. And that's what we wrestle with. And you can't see it, but you can experience it deep inside. And they're crafty and they're subtle. The battles we fight are crafty and subtle. They come at you at the most inopportune times from our perspective, but strategic times from the, the wars that we, those that we war with spiritually. The aim of the devil is to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible says that he's like a roaring lion looking to whom he may be devour. That's what we wrestle against, and we can't see it. We can't see things that are invisible. I can't see God, but I know he's there. I can't see Jesus anymore, but I know he's there. I certainly can't see the Holy Spirit, but I know he's there. These powers are present as well. They're just not omnipresent. And what I mean by that is they can only be in one place at a time. God is omnipresent. He's present everywhere all the time. Jesus' name. So then if I go down to verse 8, it says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns him. That's the second time that he says that statement about Job. So God is holding him high in esteem. And you're going to ask yourself some questions as we go on. How can things happen to him when God has him in such a high place? And he's so good relative to other people in the land. And I think the key to that is relative to other people in the land. He's good. Just like you're good relative to some other people in the land. And I'm good relative to some other people in the land. Relative to God, I don't deserve to live. And neither do you relative to God. We don't know him as much as he can be known. That's just the reality of our humanity. So after God asked him, have you considered him, one who fears God and shuns evil? Then Satan answers, and he says to the Lord in verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? So where is he getting at? Well, of course he's going to fear God and look to God. Verse 10 says, have you not made a hedge around him? So Satan is saying to God that God has put a protection around Job, one of his people that he holds in high, relatively high esteem. And he's putting a protection around him so he can't be attacked. By whom? By the enemy himself. He can't get to him. He can only get to him as far as God will allow him to get to him. The same is true for you and I. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he can only get to you to a point. What point is that? The point that God allows. He will allow him to come to you. And we'll see why in a little bit. But he will limit him as he does it. And you'll see right here just how that looks. So, you've made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side, and have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. What does this mean? This is what God does for his children who follow him. He says in John 10b, the second part of verse 10, he says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it to the full or have it more abundantly. That is why Christ came, that you would have life. All right, what does that mean? That you may have life. Does that mean it's going to go really well for you every day of your life? No. It means that you're going to have, you can have, or are going to have, depending on who you are and what decisions you make in your life, everlasting life with him. You will have life. What kind of life? Eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And we don't come to the Father except through him. We can have life. What does that mean? That means Thinking stuff is going to happen to us while we're on this earth, but in the end, we have life in him. In this life, you'll have tribulation, it says, but be of good cheer. I've overcome this, is what God says. Be of good cheer. We have people at the altar hurting. People in the audience here hurting. Why? Because stuff happens. Stinking stuff happens to us. 
Did God make it happen? No, he didn't make it happen. Did he allow it? Yes, he allowed it. Why? How do I know? Because he's sovereign. And nothing happens that he's not aware of or doesn't know about. And that's what's going to happen with Job, except you're going to see it in such an extreme way. Life is hard. John 16, 33. This is a scripture I think I just spoke to. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. I just prayed that at the altar here a little while ago. In the world you'll have tribulation or troubles. That's who. All of us will have that. All right? But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world is what he says. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is a good one. Take this one home with you. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He will let you come to a point in your temptation where you make a decision. Am I going to go to the left with the goats? Am I going to go to the right with the sheep? That's, that's what he's going to give you. You make a decision. Am I going to go and sin? Or am I going to go follow Christ? And I would say a good number of the times in the church, we take the left and I'm going to go have a good time which is only temporary, and I'm going to go sin. The beauty of Christ when we have him is we will deal with the consequences of our choice and of our sin, but he doesn't give up on us because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you always. Who's he with? His children. Who are his children? Those who have said, Jesus, be my Lord, be my Savior. I need you. I am a dead man walking without you. Dead men, come out of your grave. Come out of your grave. What is that? When a person comes to receive Jesus Christ, they're coming out of their spiritual grave. That's how I see it. If that's not what the song means, they should write the same song all over again and say, this is what it means. <laughs> dead men. Who's dead? Those who do not know Christ. So you're spiritually dead. And your life exp expands. So the time that you will live on this earth is maybe 72 years, maybe 100 and that's it as far as living. Because the rest of the eternity is, apart from God, is dying miserably, eternally. That's what happens when you're apart from God. So dead men come out of your grave. That's dead, dead men receiving Christ, coming to life. I love that song. Bo, if you're still here, I hope we do that song again today before everybody goes home. I don't know. If, is Bo still here? Okay, I didn't want you to run out and start practicing. You got to hear what we're going to say. <laughs> Dead men, come out of your grave. You not give us more than what we can handle. That doesn't mean keep jumping in tempting situations. In fact, in fact, the Bible says also that we are called to flee temptation. Don't linger in it. Don't tease yourself with it. Get out of there. Get away from temptation. Men, that woman that you're having coffee with in the coffee shop because, you know, you're good friends and everything and they help you in counseling, get out of that situation. That is a trap of traps. Do not be fools and do not be ignorant of the things of this world. Women, do not fall to those who are wooing you from afar with pleasant gifts and smiles and wise comments. Get out of there. Stay away from that. That's death to marriage, to relationships. Get away. I mean, I can't be any clearer, I think. I got about 15 stories to tell you, and I don't have time. He also tells us, okay, we don't entertain temptation. We flee temptation. Verse 11 says, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And surely curse you to your face. In fact, this is Satan talking to God now. He says, yes, you put a hedge around him, but remove the hedge. Let me at him is what he's saying, and he will curse you to your face. That's the attitude that Satan has towards you and towards me. Jesus. But what does Satan do? He goes on to attack Job through his children and his property. Can you imagine the reading that we got today when somebody comes and says, this has happened. 
All your cattle are stolen and we got hit by marauders. This has happened. All your children got killed in a storm. This has happened. Four different things happened. In each of those cases, there was one left alone alive to go tell him of what just took place. Why? To bring about pain and suffering to Job. He lost everything. But Christ, or not Christ, uh, the, atten- the enemy of your soul will attack you in the place of your property and your children. Some people jump out of buildings because the stock market crashes. Some parents don't know what to do at the loss of a child. I understand that. I wouldn't know what to do. But we have value on different things in our lives, and we put such an important emphasis on it. When the enemy of our soul comes to break you, to destroy you, to kill you, he's going to go after the things that are dear to your heart. It goes after your children, and it goes after your wealth. God would probably say, let them have the wealth. I'll take care of the children. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. If anything happens to the children, I got them. Your possessions, I don't care about your possessions. He does. He cares about you. But these are attacks that come at you and they can defeat us. And when we're defeated, we get irrational sometimes. And when we're irrational, we make decisions that are life-affecting. Some people give up because of these things. Because of things that we feel. Jesus. Jesus. After these things took place, he lost four of the the most valuable things to him. He arose, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is speaking to the righteousness of Job, that when everything is taken from him, he goes and gets prostrate before God in ashes and sackcloth, and that's just the way they did it in old times. That's how they, that's how they grieved. That's how they repented. That's how they got right before God. And he says that naked I came into this world, naked I'll leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord after he lost everything and anything that mattered to him, whether it was material or it was people, whether it was friends or it was and it doesn't matter. It was all taken from Job. And God says this is a righteous man because in the midst of his pain, he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus' name. After that, Satan has another visit up into heaven and he's talking to God again. And when he's talking to God this time, he gets past all the things that, got, that he was able to take away from Job. And he gets to the place where, sure, people, property, money, good living, all that stuff. Yeah, you could do that and he'll be all right. Let me touch his body. Let me touch his physical self. And when you allow me to touch his physical self, he will curse you to your face, is what he says. So God says, let it be, as you've said. But don't take his life. How could God do that? How could God do that? I'm going to say God did that because he loves us. He loves us so much that he will paint an example of what it takes What his heart's desire is for people. It's more of his heart's desire because he takes care of what we lack. Our heart's desire towards him should be of this this kind. In other words, he wants us to grow from where we are to where we're supposed to be. And this is a picture of something pretty good of where we're supposed to be. But we have to go through stuff to get to that place. We don't just arrive. Thank you, Jesus. Satan comes again, Adam. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes. All that a man has, he will give give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. All right? There's something I want to just share here. Satan wants to kill, he wants to steal, he wants to destroy all of us. 
He wants to go to that place. He wants to annihilate us because he hates us. Can I say hate in church? Right here I can. He hates us. But God is sovereign. And he said to the enemy of your soul and my soul, he says, this far. In other words, you can't take his life. How come? How can God do that? Because he's sovereign. He is in control. And I've said this before. Do it again. Satan is but an angry puppet in the hands of a sovereign God. God will accomplish his purposes through this vessel. I don't want to learn it through that vessel. I want to learn it because I see him. I receive him. I know it's true. I've read of his word. That's how I want to get. I don't want to have to. I don't want this from the puppet. God is in control, so he allows it to go this far and only this far. Why? Because he's at work. He's at work in Job. He's going to take Job, who is a righteous man, to another place. So then it says here, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. It is amazing to me, as I read this, how quickly Satan is at work once he has the freedom to go. You know, if you read it, you're saying, Oh, my goodness. Let it be so. And it was in the other ones, it was... Boom, 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 boom. All four things, one right after the other. Now he gets right to it and he fills him with these painful boils and sores. Job is just on a heap and he's scraping boils with potsherds of clay pottery and just, he's miserable. Just miserable. But Satan will also work at our friends, work through our friends and through our family even. In Job 32, I'm going to go back up. I'm going to go to Job 2, 9. It says, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. So she sees all the things that are happening to Job, and she comes to the understanding that this is so painful, so miserable to just observe. I can't take it anymore. Just curse God and die. Sally, don't ever say that to me. Don't ever say just curse God and die. Tell me there's a brownie waiting for me after the fast in the cupboard. That's what I want to hear. Not curse God and die. (laughs) What does that do to a person to hear that? Jesus. Jesus. Curse God and die. He attacks our friends. He attacks through our friends and our family. So she says, do you still hold fast to your integrity to curse, then curse God and die? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin. After all this, he didn't sin. Everything was taken from him. His body was attacked in a brutal kind of a way. And he still doesn't sin. And then he has the statement, do we just receive the good of God and not the adversity? Not a lot of growing takes place in the good of God. I mean, with the good of God, yes, but when we're in the good high place with God, when we're in the emotional, on fire for Jesus, it feels good, we feel his spirit moving, the growth isn't happening there like it is when we're in the pit, in the depth of our misery and hurt and pain or loss of somebody we love or whatever. This is where we grow. This is where we grow to deeper levels. Even Job, who is a righteous man in God's eyes, relative to man. So he has these three friends. Elphaz, the Temanite. Bildad, the Shuite. Zophar, the Naamathite. One says, Job sinned. His thinking is folly. He was wicked. The other said, Job should repent. You're wicked and you need to be punished. Zophar said, Job should repent for he's wicked. These are his friends. You actually don't even need enemies when you got those kind of friends. Then there's a fourth friend, and it's Elihu. And he kind of massages the whole thing. But then he comes to the place, and he says the hard thing to Job, which he did not say with the understanding. He said it with his own thinking. All right? So in Job 32, 2, it says, Then the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite, of the family of Ram was aroused against Job. Job, His wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. Also against his three friends, his wrath was aroused because they had found no answer yet and had condemned Job. So God is now laying the wood to these three friends 
And he's going to do it again at the end of this book because they weren't right, even though they said some things that on a human level they thought they could get away with and share with him and say, this is why you're, you're off. God said no. But now God is going to do the teaching, not these guys, because they were off. When you tell somebody how they've sinned and how they've done wrong, boy, you've got to be careful. We're not there to tell people what they're doing wrong. I'm here to tell the church what, what's wrong. And it's on a global method, but there better be a level of intimacy. And it's very cautious to tell people how wrong they are. Because a lot of it stems from your feelings and your opinion. That's God's business. You're to tell them the truth. And you're to tell them the truth in love, not in judgment. Too many times the truth comes with judgment. Wait it all over it. You tell somebody because you love them and, and it's got to be real. Not to stick it to them. Not to add to their heap of misery. No. Tell them what God has in store for them. Be positive. So God deals with those three. But now God's going to deal with Job. And he's going to deal with you and he's going to deal with me in similar but lesser fashion. And he says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. That's never a pleasing, enjoyable place to be for the person. When God's talking to you out of the whirlwind, you better brace up. This isn't going to be good. This is, it's going to be good, but it isn't going to be easy. It's going to be hard. I, on the other hand, would much rather hear from the still, small voice as it whispers in my ear and I feel the love of God all over me. That's how I want to hear it. But you know what? I don't listen very good there. I might get emotional, cry, boom, it's gone. But out of the whirlwind, I'm petrified and I never forget it. Think of the times that you were really frightened over something. Did you forget it? You could tell me stories from when you were seven years old. You can go back that far and hear stories when you're petrified. But you can't go back to seven years old telling me all the sweet, still sweet, small voices that God has spoken to you in. I like those. But he's going to do something here. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Oh, I don't even know if I could speak. I couldn't speak. Where were you? Oh, where were you, Job, my righteous guy, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And he begins to give him an explanation of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created this. He created this. And it was good. And it was good. Remember that? We went through that a couple months ago. He spoke and it came about. He said it and it was. And there's about seven days worth of stuff. And he gives you an overview of what he did. Right here, Job's getting the details. He's getting the fine details of what God had done in creation and is putting Job in his place. In other words, why are you whining? Why are you complaining? Here's who I am. Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I spoke creation, all creation, into existence? And then he goes on with more. Were you there when I tightened? Could you tighten the belt of Orion? Could you tighten or understand the constellation, I can't even say the word, Pelides, Pelides? Where's Trevor when I need him? Yes. <laughs> Were you there? And what's he doing? He's establishing how great he is because us in our flesh cannot understand the greatness of God. We are limited. My brain is more limited than most of your brains, I believe. But the brain of man cannot understand the things of God at the level of God. We can't. We're finite. He's infinite. We can't get to that place. So he gives them a hardcore lesson of, were you there? Do you understand where the rain comes from and how I store up the hail? And oh, it gets into so much detail. In our life group, it was so much fun talking about it. Mike and Chris were just, we were going. How, how could it be? How could he do? Oh, it was so great. What God had done. We can't get it on a human level. Job is going to get it right now. And he's getting a tongue lashing from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God of Gods, the Creator. Why? Because God is going to take him from the place of not understanding, limited thinking, to a higher place. So he can get to a higher place in his relationship with God. Why do we preach God's word every Sunday? Or why do we sing worship 
Every Sunday, we're worshiping the word of God. Not, we're not worshiping the word of God. We're worshiping with the word of God. We're worshiping God. Because it's the only way we can come to know him more. He wants a place of intimate relationship with you and with me. This is no light thing. This is his heartbeat for you. Bo, you can, Mike, you guys can come on up, your worship team. So he gives them all a Genesis. Then Job answered and said, Behold, this is verse 40, uh, chapter 40, verse 3. This is Job's response to God's message to him. And he answers the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. Why? Because he's seeing God like he's never seen him before. Verse, uh, chapter 40, verse 15, it says, Look now at behemoth. This is God talking to him. Which I had made along with you. Verse 40, verse 1. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line? Which you lower? He's telling Job, I want you to hear this. This is who I am. And do you know it? And you're going to let these things so affect you? Then Job answered and said, I know that you can do everything. Have you gotten to that place yet? Job says, I know you can do everything. Do you believe that about God? Okay. Sometimes our circumstance says he can't do this, though. Sometimes our circumstance says, I have sinned such a great sin that God could never forgive me. That's a hidden pride just for you that struggle with that. I understand how it works. But when you do that, you're saying God did not do enough on the cross for me. Christ did not do enough for me. And that's as great a sin as putting them there. I have this, this discussion with my family members who want to jump through hoop after hoop after hoop, and they can't believe that what Christ did for them was perfect. Oh, Pastor Mike, but you don't know what I've done. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter. He knows what you've done, and he still loves you. Can you believe that what he paid for you was enough? Or do you feel you've got to add a little something more? I've got to do a few rituals. I've got, got to tithe a little bit better. No, we don't do that to get him to love us more. We do that out of the abundance of love that we have from him in us. It's subtle, but it's powerful. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. No, that's what happens. We didn't understand. Neither did Job. We, we saw a lot. We read a lot. We studied a lot. But we still cannot understand the infinity. The infiniteness. No. Now I got him a child. What's the word? The, how awesome God is. How infinite he is. We can't grasp it in our human minds. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. Now, this is Job speaking to God. This is pretty, pretty confident. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor myself. I repent in dust and ashes, and this is where it's at. Job got to a place after an encounter with God that he saw God for who he was. And at that moment, he saw himself for what he was not. You understand that? We have an idea in our heads of God, but when we come face to face with him, it's beyond what we can comprehend and imagine. The Bible says if we see God in the physical, we'll die. I understand that better now than I ever have. When we see him, we see us, and we see our need for him. Salvation is no little thing. Salvation is everything. It is everything. Now we know in part. It says in Corinthians, first or second. Tim, where is it? Yeah, Tim said first or second. Now 
We know in part, but then we will know fully, even as we are fully known. We know how awesome God is in part, but when we see him fully, we will know who we are fully. Right now, we only know ourselves a little bit. We think we're all this because I gave a donation. We think we're all this because I did this. No, we are not all that. He is all that. And when I see that about myself, it puts me to my knees and I just want to repent of my sin and give it to him. I want to give him my sin because it's distasteful to him. And it does me absolutely no good. And it's the same for you. What prevents me? from giving it all to him. And I'm going to tell you right now, it is the sin of pride within all of us. It is the primary sin of Satan with God is hind end kicked out of heaven. I will be like the most high, he says. Sends him out. That's the sin is pride. What does pride look like? Pride is so stinking subtle in us. Pride is what says, I won't, this is me. I won't do this to him. I won't surrender myself to God. Pride holds me back. Pride prevents me from stepping forward to receive God. Pride prevents me from talking to the person I was called to talk to because it's embarrassing. People will see it. It's hard. That's pride. Pride is a close cousin to fear in lots of ways, but pride is its own thing too. My heart, as we move forward in the days ahead, it's to not look back, to look forward to the things that God has in store for us and to take as many with me as I can. And what he has for us is by his word. What he's called us is by his word. And it's for his purpose. And the glory of God should always go to him. That's, that's my heart for this church. So you'll hear every preacher that gets up here. And you're going to hear a lot of them. They're going to preach the word of God. Didn't Mike Waldrop do a nice job last week? He was amazing last week. There's many like him in this church. And you're going to see people up here and they're going to share the truth of God's word. You're going to hear it from Pastor Tim. You're going to hear it from Gerald. You're going to hear it from Mike. You're going to hear it from Craig. And you're going to hear it from John. You're going to hear the truth of God from these men. And you're going to hear it. You're going to hear it for Amy, from Amy and from Sally. You understand where I'm going? You're going to hear it from the brothers and sisters in Christ. I sit in my life group. You know what I hear? The word of God. How? People are speaking. Jane's speaking. Chris is speaking. speaking one to another the truth of God's word. You're going to hear it. And that's what we're called to do is share this. And what you're called to do also is measure it against what you see outside this house. I can't be up here talking to you about what's going on out there because we've been so mired by all that's going on. That you already know. Do I got to tell you about the crud every week? This is happening here. This is happening here. Ugh. That's what it feels like, talking about that nonsense that's happening outside of here. It's all over. I can't keep up to it. I learned that about 10 years ago. I learned I can't keep up to it. It's, it's, I passed the tipping point. No, here's what I can keep up with. Growing day by day in his word and sharing it. And then what the, the pastors and the elders and the people of this church up here on this altar will be doing is sharing the truth of that very thing because you can take the truth of God and you can measure it against the crud that you see happening in the world today. The things that cause fear, the things that cause an overwhelming sense of we were hopeless. No, we have an answer to all that. I want to give you the answer. You guys are the experts on what's happening out there as much as I am. Wow, I didn't even expect for that. What I'm going to do is... Um, I know we're before we're ahead of schedule, Mike. <laughs> yeah, doesn't phase him. Um, we're going to come to the front. We're going to worship together for the last five minutes of the service. If you can, 
Come on up to the front. Worship. I'm, this is a sense of what the community and the body of believers is like. Come on up. When you come up, whether you know God or not, if you know him, just say, God, I'm still here. I still love you. Keep speaking to me. If you don't know him, say, God, I'm here. Show me something. God, I'm here. I'm going to take a step and I'm going to believe you. Come to me. Fill me with all that you promise. Fill me. Some will say, I don't know you and I want to know you. Take care of that business right here. This, today it's between you and God. Next week you tell me all about it. So come on forward if you can. If you can't, I understand that's hard for some.